one is called Intercepting Impressions, the Animal Industrial Complex and the Educational Industrial Complex. Um, it's presented by Menica Thirukumaran. Yeah. How do you say it like really fast? <laughs> Thirukumaran. Thirukumaran, okay. And um, just a short bio of her. Uh, she is a teacher, scholar, activist, advocate, and artist living in Calgary, Alberta. She holds a BFA from Alberta College of Art and Design, a BED from the University of Lethbridge, and an MA from Concordia University. Medica is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. Her dissertation employs focus group research to investigate the school experience of teenagers who are vegan. Medica is primarily interested in transforming educational spaces to reflect values of intersection, intersectionality, inclus, inclusivity, and justice. And um, so she's going to speak for about like 20 to 25 minutes, and then after that, uh, we'll do like a public Q and A for about 30 minutes after that. And and I'll let you know like how much time. Okay. Right. okay. Um, mine actually might end up being a little bit shorter because I'm actually in two presentations. So if you flip to the very end, I'm doing that one right now. And I'm going <coughs> to schedule for now, I'm doing it at the end. Um, okay, so hello everyone. Thank you so much um, for coming. And it's great to be here. Thank you to Anthony and Sean and everyone else who helped to organize uh, the conference. So the title of my presentation I actually changed, um, so it's a working title, <laughs> um, towards anti-capitalist education, the animal industrial complex, and the educational industrial complex. So this presentation and paper were inspired by an earlier issue of JCAS, so Journal for Critical Animal Studies. Um, and that issue was a special issue um, paralleling the prison industrial complex with the animal industrial complex. Um, and so I was really interested in um, further expanding that to also include schools. Um, and I should add that a lot of these um, parallels that I'm going to make will probably also work in a post-secondary situation. But just for the focus of my work, I'm going to use K-12, to so kindergarten to grade 12, um, because that's where most of my experience is. Um, so br just briefly, sorry, <laughs> before I get started, I'm just going to contextualize um, place and where I'm from. So I'm from Alberta, Canada, and specifically a city called Calgary. And Alberta is, a lot of people think of it like the Texas of Canada, so the main commodities are oil, gas, and cattle. Um, and so the schools kind of really embrace that um, flavor. Um, so in this presentation, I'm just going to, t I structured my paper into three main components. So parallels in terms of the structure of both of these institutions, um, and then the really bizarre relationship that curriculum, like taught curriculum, has with the non-human animal agriculture industry, um, and then finally how values in a capitalist school system um, kind of promote ideas that are not conducive to collective liberation. And then I had questions, but we'll just do that together at the end. Okay, so first of all, there are some really obvious structural similarities between slaughterhouses and schools. Um, so you can kind of tell a little bit just by looking at these two pictures, but um, first there's this idea of surveillance and disciplinary power. So when you think of a slaughterhouse, the people that are working on the kill floor have very little power, their job is very mechanical, and they're just killing, um, and they don't even control the speed of the kill line. Um, and they're very much answering to an external authority. Um, and that's kind of similar in schools. So if you think about students, they're kind of the lowest people in a school. Um, they have to sit in rows, typically. They have to put up their hands. So there's all of these mechanisms that put power in someone else's uh, hands, essentially. So the teacher is the disciplinarian, and the teachers are further disciplined by principals, who are then further disciplined by um, administrators, and then governments. Um, there's also the idea of segregation, so uh, slaughterhouses are usually physically segregated from cities and from the rest of society, so they remain hidden. Um, and it's kind of similar with schools, so when parents send their uh, children off to schools, they essentially get to forget about them for, you know, six to eight hours a day because they're away, they're in a separate building, um, and they're far from where their parents are. Um, and they also um, 
like both children and non-human animals that are being sent to slaughter move through a, st a series of stages in a process that is eventually designed to make them ready to be a product. So that kind of makes sense with slaughterhouses. For children, the stages they move through are grades. So the only thing they have in common are the people that are really, like they're segregated by age, and then they move through those grades until they're ready for society to consume, essentially. Um, there's also petty mechanisms that are used in both slaughterhouses and schools. So one of them, um, is like the de-individualization. So we see that in slaughterhouses with things like ear tags um, and like maybe tattoos on ears of non-human animals. And with schools, that happens with things like ID cards or like ID tags or even ID numbers that are assigned to students. Um, they're also organized quantifiably in terms of lining up. So we force non-human animals to line up as they march to their own slaughter. Um, and we force children to line up for a variety of different procedures as well so that we can control them and it's more efficient for the system. Um, and finally, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next section, but um, structurally it's interesting that both systems also rely on the corporate funding and interests from other groups. So um, for slaughterhouses, what that looks like is like genetics testing companies are often aligned with slaughterhouses and sometimes post-secondary institutions as well benefit from the commodification of these non-human animals. Um, and in terms of schools, um, schools are often, um, they're sponsored by companies like, like one school I worked at was sponsored by Pepsi, so our entire gym had Pepsi stuff all over it. Um, but also things like textbooks and computers and sometimes school resources are paid for by these companies. Um, so there's this very like incestuous relationship between schools and companies. Um, so I'm going to discuss that in a little bit more detail in the curriculum section. So in Alberta, our curriculum that teachers are legally required to teach, um, all of those curricular objectives are online. So they're on a website called Alberta Learning. Um, and anyone can access that. So a child can access it and any member of the community or public. Um, so that makes it really easy for corporate interest groups to come up with lesson plans and other resources that they design specifically for teachers to use. And of course, um, that then calls into question the idea of schools as neutral places then. So one example of that, I'm just gonna focus on <coughs> the non-human animal agriculture industry. And so this is just one example. There are many resources that teachers get. Um, and if you think about it, teachers are, they have a lot of work to do, they have a lot of paperwork to do. So when someone gives a teacher a free lesson plan, um, it can be really um, tantalizing, I guess, to use that lesson plan. Because um, the teacher will know then that it's already aligned with the government mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, so this is one that a parent um, of one of my participants showed me. Um, and so it says, grow with agriculture. Um, so you can already kind of look just with the imagery. So first of all, the title, grow with agriculture, is kind of bizarre. Um, so it's really positioning the physical growth of children with the economic growth of the non-human agriculture industry, assuming that those things are going to go together. Um, it also reinforces the assumption that non-human animal products as meat are necessary for the physical growth of children. Um, and then as you can see, it also utilizes this really pastoral, idyllic, nostalgic imagery of non-human animal agriculture to sell uh, meat, essentially, and make, make children lifelong consumers of meat. Um, so this one's called Farm Crush Alberta. It uh, deals with chicken and eggs. And we'll just zoom in on that top section there. Um, so this one again was like the imagery I found to be really problematic. So um, from a very basic level, it's a very sterilized portrayal of chicken and egg production. So the big glaring thing that stood out to me is that it really ignores a lot of the procedures that these hens are subjected to, such as they call it beak trimming, but it's essentially amputation of the beaks. Um, and that's nowhere in this image. But it was on another, uh, on another resource designed for older children, they do discuss it. Um, and how they rationalize it is that beak trimming is necessary for it makes it easier for chickens to eat, apparently. Um, so it really just ignores the idea that you know 
hens in sanctuaries are just fine without having that done. Um, yeah. So again, there's the portrayal of a small-scale family farm, um, and then that's supposed to correlate to, if you can see at the end, it's supposed to end up at a grocery store. Um, so that actually makes no sense from a mathematical standpoint alone. Um, if you're shopping for chicken and eggs at a grocery store, there's no way it came from a farm that looks like the one in the picture. Um, and then finally, there's the idea of intergenerational whiteness associated with um, farming in Alberta. So no one in the image, I know it's kind of hard to see with the color on the screen, but in real life, um, so everyone from the children who are learning about this process to the people in the processing plant and the hatchery are all white. Um, so that kind of, um, it reinforces the idea that farming in Alberta is synonymous with white Alberta identity. Okay, so yeah, this one, I have two for milk, and I'm just going to quickly discuss the pro like problematic nature of school milk programs. Um, so I, you probably can't see, but one, just one of the sentences is that cows produce more milk than their calf will need, so that's what children are learning. Um, here's another one, so like again, from a very basic standpoint, it's uh, associating milk consumption with happiness and fun and games and like everyone including the cows are really happy to be drinking the milk. Um, the other, I feel like the other more important problem with school milk programs is that they're very colonial. So 80, uh, if you think about schools as ethnically diverse places, 80% um, of the world actually don't have a tradition of cow's milk consumption um, and many indigenous and non-western populations uh, people can actually digest cow's milk, including me. Um, so that kind of uh, is problematic with the idea of cow's milk as a highly nutritious and perfect food. That's often how it's marketed. Um, and then it becomes associated with the perfectibility of bodies and the superiority of specific bodies. Um, so then bodies that can't digest milk are sort of thought of as deficient or intolerant. Um, that's kind of I feel like a problematic power dynamic when you have diverse schools. Um, it also speaks to the power of the West to define uh, global dietary norms, right? Okay, so how is my time? Okay, um, so the final thing with curriculum that I found really problematic was Alberta, we have this thing called the Calgary Stampede. Um, and the Stampede is essentially a large, it's uh, rodeo, chuck wagon races, and calf roping is how it originated, but now in the last probably 30 years, um, there's been other things like roller coasters and like fair food and it kind of becomes this big capitalist adventure. Um, so one component of the Stampede is called Eggy Days, and that's kind of like a cute term for agriculture days, and it's used to bring in children and teachers. So this is a photo of one Aggie Days exhibit. So this is actually at the exhibit and children and public can walk around um, and they can watch this mother sow in a gestational crate with her babies. Um, so there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I won't have time to fully go through all of them, but first of all, like the normalization of violence. Um, there's also this idea of um, non-human animal as a spectacle or as a curio whose only purpose is for human observation and curiosity. Um, and then of course the objectification of female um, non-human animal bodies and a complete disregard for female reproductive autonomy. Um, there's also another one, so I'm just going to read you a quote here from one of the <coughs> parents that I interviewed. Um, so she says, I remember from the exhibit at Stampede that there is a life-size cow with a lifelike vagina. They get kids to line up, stand on a stool, and put their arms in, violating the cow to feel her fetus. So I thought that was a little bizarre. Um, and so not only are children then learning that humans are superior and that they have control over the sexuality of non-human animals, but that this is like like acceptable and like totally okay in these industries. Um, okay, and then so the final section I wanted to discuss was the values in the schools. Um, so sc there, I know that there are a lot of schools, particularly here in the States, there's three that come to mind. Um, there's one called Alternative Academy, there's Muse School, 
um, and then there's the Institute for Humane Education, um, and those schools are definitely working against this capitalist system of education, however, they're private, and so they're not financially accessible to most students. So I'm really just talking about public schools here, but um, so the first value is conformity. Um, we know that with capitalist systems in general, um, but in schools, children are very, uh, they're depersonalized, they're isolated, they're seated in rows, making them easier to be controlled um, and easily silenced. Um, and so the main objective of that is obedience, right? Because we want these children to grow up to be obedient workers in the workforce. Um, there's also a fragmentation of subject areas. So I don't know if anyone remembers, but I know for me, when I was in school, you would go to math class and you'd have a math lesson and then you'd go to science and you'd have a science lesson, etc. Um, so there's a fragmentation of subjects, um, and subjects are deprived from context. Very often when we learn things, we are actually learning more than one subject at a time. Um, and so this deprives subjects from their context and uh, prevents children from making connections between disciplines. Um, there's also an emphasis on competition, so that occurs through like test scores and standardized testing. Um, and things like honor roll, which create a hierarchical order. Um, and then that leads to these really problematic binary systems in schools. So academically strong, academically weak. Physically strong, physically weak. Human, non-human. We think of like dissection, for example. Um, yes, I think that's all I have to say about that. Sorry. Oh, no. Anthony, what did I do? Okay, I think that's essentially it. Um, yeah. You ready to go? Yeah, I had one more thing, but I don't know what I did. justice is sort of sold and marketed in schools is also very problematic so in typically in like high schools and junior highs um, they will have things like gay straight alliance club or like black hispanic alliance club or like immigrant club like just the environmental club and like animal club and these really weird um, different clubs but very it's very rare to see these different clubs working together um, and it's also kind of problematic from a school perspective. So um, these different clubs are in constant competition for the attention of school resources and teachers who must supervise them. Um, and they operate more to pacify students and say, okay, here you go, here's something just for you, um, rather than to cultivate meaningful change, uh, which could be accomplished through unity and collaboration. That is the end. Okay, thank you.
It's going to be presented by Ms. Alexandra. Can you say your last name? Isfahani Hammond. Isfahani Hammond. Okay. And um, a brief bio on her is um, she is currently an associate professor of comparative literature at the University of California, San Diego. Her research has been shaped by a concern with intersecting structures of commodification, engaging with literary and cinematic production, as well as the social and biological sciences. She has established herself as an innovative inter interdisciplinary and transnational scholar who conjoins Atlantic studies with species studies through post-structural and eco-critical readings of what society calls thingification, discourse on colonialism. My current or her current book project, Postcolonial Zoo Poetics, uh, Species in Brazil, the United States, and Africa, represents an extension of her previous research on slavery and race in Brazil. <coughs> Postcolonial Zoo Poetics will be published in Penn State University Press Series, Animal Animalibus of Animals and Cultures. Thank you. <coughs> I wish to dedicate my talk to Juma the Jaguar. As Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd wrote on Facebook last June, the Olympic travesty of 2016 will be most remembered as the farce that murdered a jaguar, and as such I could not care less who wins one of those silly gold, silver, or bronze medals. All that I will remember is a noble animal lying in a pool of her own blood, with a Brazilian soldier standing over her with a smoking rifle. I've been at work on two seemingly distinct projects. One, a zoocritical study of Brazilian literature and cinema. The other, a collection of memoirs about caregiving and grief. This talk gives me a chance to bring them together, despite some bumpy transitions. So I'll appreciate your feedback. To explain how I arrived here, my experiences with the interface of race and species evolves out of 25 years teaching in academic departments in which animal studies was not only too extreme, but seen as antagonistic to human rights, and in particular, social justice for peoples of color. Questions of species and race seemed to be incompatible, and being a part of these academic communities required silence. I recall a member of my cohort, cohort stating of some animal rights protesters at UC Berkeley's uh, Sproul Plaza. These students care more about animals than they do about people of color. This discomfort was... Um, this discomfort was the catalyst for my perplexed meditation, out of which I began to tentatively articulate a rejoinder, beginning with, I learned to care about other species from my Iranian mother who at age 14 swallowed her last bit of animal flesh after witnessing one too many acts of slaughter. The quotidian public butchering of lambs, goats, and chickens hadn't offered her the veil behind which the reality of slaughterhouses is hidden in the industrialized West. She had also learned a thing or two about intersecting forms of violence from her own mother, who wept to the cries of inmates being tortured in the Shah's nearby prison cells and fed homemade yogurt to the, near, near, to the neighborhood straight cats and dogs to induce vomiting and, hence, eliminate the poison routinely administered by animal control. My empathy has a much less predictable trajectory than you wish to allow. Together with the disclosure of my individual animalist trajectory from the Shah's prisons to livestock butchering blocks, I came to understand not only the symbolic inversion constituted by ethical veganism's association with white privilege, but moreover, white privilege's reliance upon discourses of speciation. In Between the World and Me, ta Coates' language for people who believe they are white lends itself to a dialogue about the pretense of human versus animal, though to adapt his words to this end points to the lesion between civil rights and ethical veganism. You are well versed, all of you, in the obstacles up to alliances between anti-racism and anti-speciesism given that many of the most visible U.S. animal advocacy organizations lack critical awareness uh, of the nuances of race, class, gender, and sexual exploitation, even as they harness these related modalities for their own purposes. While PETA invokes slavery and the Holocaust, at the other end of the spectrum, speciesists seize upon tradition, especially indigenous tradition, 
to deflect arguments about the ethical and environmental devastation of animal agriculture with declarations like, but Native Americans blessed the animals before killing them. Does the speaker consider herself a Native American at heart, uttering a prayer each time she consumes a chicken wing? Does she think this originary blessing sanctifies all subsequent violence inflicted on so-called animals within the United States? a polity itself perversely validated through the fetish of Native American spirituality and tropes of indigenous resistance employed in the name of football, redskins, and military force, Apache, Comanche, Chinook, Lakota, etc. Does the speaker think the animal gives a damn whether they were blessed by their killer? Rationalizations for so-called humans' yearly rendering of billions of animals rely also upon non-Western subsistence fishers and hunters and our remote ancestors, as in the paleo diet, wherein Neanderthal's dependency on raw meat symbolically infuses 21st century animal husbandry with romanticism, primitivism, hypermasculinity, and despite the, the direct causal relation between animal agriculture and environmental collapse, being quote unquote in touch with nature. What follows is an attempt to probe the prototype of respectful indigenous slaughter and substitute it with a series of counter-narratives. Taken from, first, uh, Brazilian literature and cinema, second, the contemporary Brazilian socio-political scene, and third, my evolving understanding of animal life as the result of caregiving and mourning my parents' deaths. In tribute to Carol Adams' feminist vegetarian interruptions, Joy Williams' rants, and, as we will see, Guimarães Rosa's meows and growls, it is inspired by Elizabeth Costello's observation that literature is more formidable than rational argumentation in stimulating an empathic response. To quote, if I can think my way into the existence of a being who has never existed, then I can think my way into the existence of a bat or a chimpanzee or an oyster, any being with whom I share the substrate of life. I begin with a discussion of anthropophagia, anthropophagy. Originally a colonial fantasy, the idea of the indigenous man-eater inverted and sustained Europe's destruction of indigenous and African peoples, while also concealing the intensification of violence against so-called animals with animal husbandry. The discourse of anthropophagia elaborated by Brazilian moder modernist intellectuals during the 1920s and 30s spoofs Brazilian uh, cultural identity, identifying the Tupi cannibal as tongue-in-cheek national leitmotif. In dialogue with European surrealism and prim primitivism, anthropophagia is a critique of colonial fetishism which privileges Brazil's racial and cultural heterogeneity, defining the nation's predominant characteristic as the consumption of that which is foreign. Cannibalism becomes a way for Brazil to produce a new and dynamic culture on the basis of ingesting its enemies, Portugal and later the United States. This cannibalistic driving force is captured by Osvaldo Andrade's pronouncement in English, to pee or not to pee, that is the question, which itself devours Shakespeare to regurgitate an original proverb. And to pee Guarani are the predominant uh, indigenous group in Brazil. A neglected implication of European <coughs> stigmatization of man-eating is that it masks the massive scale slaughter and consumption of non-human animals pretended by colonization. By extension, an understudied dimension of anthropophagia is its intersecting critiques of whiteness and anthropocentrism. If eating the other is a means to evade being eaten or racially diluted, anthropophagia parodies the European drama of a natural order wherein whites consume non-whites, and animal life is continuously subject to ethically and legally condoned violence. As Carrie Wolf reminds us, Freud observes that eating non-humans ensures the prohibition against eating humans that is the, at the core of the Western Judeo-Christian ethos. One of Brazil's most important anthropophagic cinema novel films, Nelson Pereira dos Santos, how, how Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, which came out in uh, 1971, provides an example. In Como Era Gostoso, How Tasty Was My Frenchman, the Tupinamba tribe give their captive a, white, a widow for a wife, who seduces him and with whom he lightheartedly rehearses his ritualized killing. Robert Stamm defines Dos Santos' film as an anthropophagic critique of European colonialism. 
It offers a didactic lesson in cultural relativism, indirectly posing Montaigne's question, uh, who are the real barbarians, and inverting the homogenizing convention by which Europeans perceive only generic Indians. They are all the same. Hence, the Indians are unable to distinguish between the French and the Portuguese. Uh, Randall Johnson observes that the inability of the tribe to discern that their captive is French reveals the fundamental conflict between Europeans and Brazilians, as opposed to the system of alliances between the Tupini King and Portuguese on the one hand, and the Tupinamba and the French on the other. Let's take Como Era Gostoso's treatment of false dichotomies and misinformed alliances a step farther. The majority of Dusanto's film consists in the prisoner's attempts to prove he is French so as not to be killed and eaten by his Tupinamba captors. The irony is that the Frenchman is killed because the tribe thinks he is Portuguese and thus their enemy, whereas the audience knows he is French. Friend, not foe, the captive is not properly edible. So the chief tells his captor, captive that he will morir como un animal, die like an animal. Underscoring this parody and pointing to the ultimate commonality rather than difference between captor and captive, the Tupinamba incorporate him into the social organization of the tribe, making him one of them prior, prior to consuming him. On the one hand, tribal custom allows the captive to become a member of the community prior to his death. But the director's emphasis upon the shaky reasoning according to which he qualifies as meat points to an arbitrary, unreliable human-animal dialectic. <clears throat> Carrie Wolfe's interpretation of Jonathan Demme's thriller, uh, The Silence of the Lambs, 1991, helps us think about Dos Santos' film. Reading species in relation to Western anxiety about what Freud dismisses as perverse zoophiliac identification with non-human animal suffering, Wolf observes that Hannibal Lecter's message is not, I eat animals and therefore not humans, but rather, I eat animals and therefore humans. In the silence of the lambs, eating flesh, this is from Wolf, eating flesh is not an injunction against eating human flesh, but instead an invitation to it. Dem subversively demonstrates that what Lecter does to humans and what Buffalo Bill does to Catherine is precisely what speciesist society does to animals. But ultimately, the film calls upon, upon Starling to overcome her identification with the lambs of her childhood trauma by means of an energetic ascent out of her working class past and into the law of culture embodied by the FBI a compensatory silencing of the lambs that only drives a wedge between women and animals, the two homologous objects of Warren's logic of domination. It says in so many words that Starling has finally arrived at full subjectivity because she now understands that lambs cannot be saved, only people can. I now turn to the contemporary political arena to show you how wide-ranging cannibalist narratives are in Brazil. With conflicts between political parties imag imagined in terms of ingesting the defeated enemy's bodies. On May 12, 2016, Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff was ousted in a coup mobilized by Brazilian elites, supported by U.S. financial interests, and facilitated by Hedge Global, the media conglomerate which also manufactured consent with the military coup of 1964. The Golpistas stir traumatic memories of the dictatorship. Among the new government's first orders of business was to establish an all-white, all-male cabinet, shut down the ministries of culture, human rights, women's rights, and racial justice, soften the definition of slavery by removing the terms degrading conditions and exhausting shifts from the legal classification of slave labor, and curtail the provision of rice and beans to poor people known as bolsa familiar. <clears throat> The forces behind the coup are, are reminiscent of a fascistic league of cannibalistas known as the Verde Amarelos, the yellow greens, the colors of Brazil's flag, seen in abundance during the coups of both 1964 and 2016. In contradistinction to the progressive anthropophagic modernistas, in the 1930s and 40s, the Verde Amarelismo, or yellow greenism, of the integralists employed man-eating as a metaphor for authoritarian governance. Influential during Getulio Vargas' first mandate from 1930 to 1945, their ultra-nationalism envisioned the dual authority of the state 
and A Familia Brasileira, the Brazilian family, in capital letters. In a chilling echo of the Integralists man-eating, the April 26, I'm sorry, the April 17, 2016 Lower House of Congress vote to impeach Dilma was a spe spectacle of testosterone-driven shouting in which the 513-member Chamber of Deputies rose one by one to declare that Dilma should be ousted in the name of God and the Brazilian family. This ritual destruction culminated with the outrageous speech by Federal Deputy Jair Bolsonaro in which he dedicated his vote for impeachment to Coronel Brilhante Ustra, the former head of Doi Koji, the Brazilian uh, intelligence and specifically anti-communist repression unit during the military regime from 64 to 85, the first name of whose acronym, DOI, means pain or hurt. Doi Koji was known for its torture methods, and Brilhante Ustra was specifically responsible for devising torture methods for women prisoners, and in particular, pregnant prisoners. Bolsonaro's exact words were that he dedicated his vote to the memory of Coronel Carlos Alberto Brilhante Ustra, the dread of Dilma Rousseff. <clears throat> Bolsonaro's celebration of Rousseff's dread resubjected her to the tortures she had sustained without naming names during the year she was imprisoned for her anti-dictatorship activities from 1970 to 1972. The cannibalistic undertones of the coup became even more overt with the disclosure on May 23rd of a series of phone conversations providing evidence that Dilma's impeachment was directly related to obstructing the anti-corruption investigations known as Lava Jato, or car wash. Homero Juca says, quote, we have to change the government in order to halt the investigation's bloodletting. And he expresses alarm that if the investiga investigations continue, a vast cadre of, of pro-coup politicians will be eaten. His exact words were, Everybody on the, everybody on the platter to be eaten. And the first to be eaten will be M.I.J., a reference to his ally, Senator Aesio Neves from the state of Minas Gerais. <clears throat> Dozens of memes were immediately generated about Brazil's anthropophagic politics and Aesio being eaten, including one featuring Hannibal Lecter behind bars reading to Aesio from a list. Are you the first to be eaten? As one friend posted, it's too tempting not to talk about it. I can see why gringos are obsessed with anthropophagia. Another friend said, I'm just getting back online and need you to get me up to date. Has Aisio been eaten yet? It is important to note that in Brazilian Portuguese, comer also connotes sexual penetration. Cannibalism is an omnipresent trope in Brazilian culture whose relevance for species, that, for species strikes me as an open secret. <coughs> Another is the zoocritical reflection of João Guimarães Rosa, who lived from 1908 to 1967 and is considered one of Brazil's greatest writers of all times. In his short story, My Uncle the Jaguar, in 1961, published in 1961, Rosa's mixed-race narrator is a former wildcat hunter who becomes remorseful about the suffering he has inflicted on creatures he now acknowledges as kin. They left me, oh, and then there's a long quote I want to read. Um, as Davina Marquez observes, his empathic transformation is signaled by abandonment of Portuguese, the colonial language, in, in favor of a blend of indigenous Tupi-Guarani together with the onomatopoeia of the wildcat. Uh, Rosa's uh, hunter turned feline takes revenge, recognizes that cats are kin, even falling in love with one of them, and is haunted by the kinfolk he has killed remembering the graphic details of how each was stalked, ambushed, and destroyed. The taming of Brazil's sertão, or so-called backlands, the indigenous genocide, and the marketing of jaguar pelts come together as hybrid trans-species yowls, meows, and roars mediate the hunter's transformation from man to animal. Watching my mother and father slowly waste away activated an ancient trans-species murmuring. Scared stiff, I had what Amazonian shamans call susto, which literally means fright or shock, and is characterized as a form of chronic somatic suffering 
stemming from emotional trauma or from witnessing traumatic events lived by others. Frequently conceptualized as a case of spirit attack, and what Western medicine defines as a combination of PTSD, depression, and con chronic active Epstein-Barr. I began attending ayahuasca ceremonies, hoping to restore my vitality and ameliorate my haunting relationships with the dead. Ayahuasca is an entheogen which is said to open a pathway between the worlds, providing instruction in living and dying. An entheogen, for those who don't know, is a plant medicine, frequently hallucinogenic, used in spiritual practice. Ayahuasca returns me to the, to the experience of watching my parents disappear, first stopping to catch their breaths, then skeletal and immersed in deathbed visions, their bodies changing you. <clears throat> Though the process of painstakingly deconstructing these experiences is difficult, I invariably feel connected to something larger. Part of that connection involves being drawn into locales ranging from primate experimentation labs to bullfighting rings, but most consistently with, with captive pigs. I feel their heavy, terrified bodies and wide, shocked eyes. We go shoulder to shoulder as the truck shakes along the highway, the metal casings clattering in the frigid air. Their suffering is extreme, incessant, and massive scale, and my desolation is aggravated by the fact that the vast majority do not see or care. How can I be their best advocate? Words don't open cages, and writing doesn't re resolve the problem of pigs huddled together on a slaughterhouse-bound truck. <laughs> Just as Native Americans bless the animals, the Quran dictates that so-called animals are offered a prayer and water before slaughter. I feel my mother watching them as they crane their necks from the gourd, disinterested in water, their eyes fixed precisely on the glistening bit blade poised alongside it. I feel her brutalized love in her care for the sparrows her own mother, Sakine, would catch and instruct her daughter to hold within her small palms, conveying them to a, late, to a neighbor who would behead them, sending my mother with their lifeless bodies back to Sakine to cook. I am with her, delivering the soft, fluttering animals to their deaths. With such tenderness, she cradles them before surrendering them to their executioner. The horror never leaves her, nor do the sparrows. They take roost within her, stretching up through her neck to, peel out, to <coughs> peer out through her coal-rimmed eyes, surveying a world of treachery, but also the wide blue sky to which they hope to return. At age eight in Dunn, North Carolina, I stood beside an injured pig, fallen or escaped from a slaughterhouse-bound truck, her breathing being an affront to the clandestine domain of intensive animal agriculture. We gathered on the black asphalt by her prone body, the adults exchanging words about what was to be done as the odors of gasoline and oil intermingled with the scent of charred flesh wafting from Dobbs' garage and grill. My mother eventually led me away by the hand, explaining that the adults' talk about saving the pig meant only that she would be preserved to be killed and eaten. She took me back to the road several times to keep the injured pig company. She was barely moving, but her eyes were wide open. My mother said things that other people did not, for she never came to terms with the killing all around her, unlike Sterling in The Silence of the Lambs, who eventually discards her naive, immature empathy for animals. Holding sparrows in her palms as they received their death blows, she refused to accept the, the narratives that would make it all right. To be held in the gaze of my dying mother, was to see myself, flesh atop bone that would turn to ash, and to be beholden to sparrows. Donna Haraway writes about the ways in which guardians and their co-species trade cellular information as a result of centuries-long contact, adapting and evolving in dialogue with one another, exchanging DNA through skin and saliva. She stops coldly short of recognizing the radical potential of that contact and the instability of the human that always threatens, like Roser's hunter, to turn feline. One of the ways this eruption or outburst occurs is through narratives of transspecies cellular or embodied empathy. Rosa's growl interfaces with the ir irreality of what Elizabeth Costello calls the sympathetic imaginary, her attunement to the quotidian horrors to which the vast majority is indifferent, such that she wonders if she is mad. Surrounded by murders, murderers, is it she who sees things askew? I quote, a sparrow knocked off a branch by a slingshot, a city annihilated from the air. Who dare, who dare say which is the worst?
represented by um, Jessica Ison. She is the representative for ICAS in Oceana. She is a PhD. She is a PhD candidate at La Trobe University and a tutor in gender studies and animal studies. In her spare time, Jess can be found ranting about prison abolition and fermentation. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for having me. It's um, so wonderful to be here. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to start um, by acknowledging that um, I'm on uh, native land. Uh, I think of the Uke people, the Southern Uke. Um, and in Australia, we always um, like to pay respect to whose land we're on, um, particularly uh, as a colonised country, um, and to acknowledge uh, the privilege um, and that um, we need to keep working towards changing uh, white supremacy and colonialism. So um, I just thought maybe we'd take a second uh, to acknowledge that and to think of um, whose land we're on. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to do um, uh, one of my papers on uh, some of my PhD research. Um, as you can see from the beginning, um, my PhD research is very um, academic. Uh, from <coughs> Answers.com. Um, so that's 10 years of higher education and a... a a lot of money right there for me to bring you this. Why don't lesbians eat meat? Answer. Not all lesbians don't eat meat. It's a matter of personal preference, which, include, which includes various factors. So I just thought I'd enlighten you all about that. <coughs> so, um, I want to start with a story. Um, the, the, <coughs> let me get my, uh, so, who knows the TV show Queer as Folk? Few people. Okay, so um, the start from Queer as Folk, whose name is Brian Kinney, uh, is one day getting a blowjob in the back room of the club called Babylon. He's trying to unwind after a really hard week at work because he's trying to figure out an advertisement for a steakhouse. And so he's there getting a blowjob, and the person next to him, who's a bear, like not one of your bears, more like a gay <laughs> type of bear, uh, is also getting a blowjob from, you know, another bear. Um, and he's, he's, um, he, the person getting the blowjob next to him says to the person blowing him, I guess the blowee, um, he says, that's right boy, eat the meat. And then Brian laughs because he's figured out his advertising campaign for the steakhouse. <laughs> so in my work I'm trying to work through the ways that we can bring together um, queer theory and animal uh, studies, and, but also queer activism and animal activism. So this is one of the things that I've been thinking through a lot. Um, so. In this, at this conference, we thought a lot about the different forms of exploitation and different types of what we call intersectionality. Um, and so, in my paper, I'm um, going to talk about the ways in which animals are now being used in a process of what we call homonormativity. Oh, that's uh, that one. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure if people are familiar with this term. So, we have this concept called heteronormativity, which basically just means um, everything is really, really straight. Uh, and that's seen as what the norm is, right? And so then um, we're told to kind of assimilate into this straight world. Um, and anyone who's queer knows what this is like. Whenever you're feeling a bit hungover on a Sunday and you try to watch like someone queer on TV or on a movie and you're just like, man, I'm so sick of watching straight people get it on in that really bland way. Uh, but you've already watched all the bad queer films and so you've got to watch reruns of Queer as Folk. And then, you know, hence really good PhD research. Um, so that's called heteronormativity. So what we call homonormativity means um, straight, uh, gay people trying to create a certain types of gay norms that are acceptable. Case in point, gay marriage, right? So the idea is, the idea is um, we should be able to get married and be just like straight people. We should be able to be in the military and kill people just like straight people, right? This is what the big gay agenda is right now, which is a tragedy since um, queer liberation started off very, very radically. Um, so, this, this is uh, yes, yeah, so this is what we call homonormativity, and that's what I'm talking about a lot in this paper. The ways in which um, we see uh, social movements start to um, uh, be lured into into uh, conforming, right? And so, uh, gay liberation has been doing this dramatically. Um, it's been completely whitewashed. And it's also now, with things like gay marriage, trying to make us just like straight people, right? So yeah, this is, um, 
Um, this is case in point um, of one type of homonormativity. So this is from the, um, so you ever know the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras? It's like the biggest, one of the biggest gay events in the world, right? Um, so, oh, actually, I can update this, because this is, so ANZ is one of the biggest banks, needless to say they're evil. Um, and this is some of the other sponsors. So if we think about um, Gay Liberation started at Stonewall, or actually before then, uh, but most people think of it as the Stonewall in the West, uh, with Sylvia Rivera throwing a uh, brick at the police. And here we are. I don't, you probably don't know some of those um, corporations. Or actually, you probably know all of them because they're international. Um, but actually, this is a little updated thing that I noticed while I was here, which is just so great. Um, the gay, uh, Mardi Gras board has just, last year, um, our Prime Minister, oh no, it was this year, <coughs> marched in the Mardi Gras. He's the first um, sitting Prime Minister to march, actually, in the parade. Um, so, aside from um, all of uh, everyone who's been hearing my rants about problematic things in Australia, um, we have really terrible refugee laws, um, in case you don't know. Um, you, you're talking about, your now president's talking about building a wall. Well, we put our refugees on islands, so we already have a wall. Um, so, he marched in the Mardi Gras, um, and um, there was a huge, um, there was some, right there, it just happened to be right next to a, a refugee group. Um, you can watch the footage, um, and they start yelling at him, which was wonderful. Um, so, uh, this, just the other day, the Mardi Gras board were like, hey, you're not allowed to march in the parade anymore until we have gay marriage. And I was like, okay, so you're allowed to march in the parade with your refugee laws, but you're not going to give us gay marriage? Oh, no, nah, you're not allowed in, right? So this is kind of the state of gay politics. Um, and one of these things is also, I'll just go back here, neoliberalism. <coughs> Most of you probably know what neoliberalism is. If you don't, just think Hillary Clinton, case in point. All of her um, legislation, all of her ideas is is neoliberalism. This is the era we live in, but it's really odd, most people don't know what it is. Um, but our time right now is, is commonly now called neoliberalism. So the way that um, gay liberation has started to change is within homonormativity, which is very neoliberal. Um, so I've got some quotes there. Um, the legal reform work that currently un operates under the rubric of lesbian and gay rights, or sometimes LGBT, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, is an example of this shift from a more transformative social movement agenda to an inclusion and incorporation focused professionalised non-profit legal reform project. That's from Dean Spade. And this other one is from um, Brian Conrad. The neoliberal fantasy of the nuclear family is the only provider of emotional and economic safety is being recovered and deployed by the contemporary gay rights movement. So the idea is we should be able to get married and leave behind white picket fences just like straight people. Uh, but who's being left out of that narrative? Well, in Australia, um, we have uh, four to 5,000 homeless queer youth on the street every night. Um, so uh, the marriage campaign is um, taking away so much of our money um, when it should be getting funneled into um, things like homeless queer youth, homeless uh, and queer youth suicide. Queer and trans youth, I should say. Oh yeah, and there is just a little example. There's some more of my really good um, research for you. Um, so, I typed into DuckDuckGo, Sydney Mardi Gras, and the first thing that came up was, Australian Bank creates an LGBT-inspired branch for Sydney Mardi Gras. Isn't that nice? Creating a nice little thing for us gays. Um, and they had some gay penguins. You know, you know about the gay penguins at the zoo in Sydney? They're gay and they get given an egg out and even want to go there. Okay. <laughs> So, let's see if this works for otherwise I'll pull it up. So this is my um, example, another example in your um, American context. Let's hope it gets down to you, because otherwise my whole thing is going to be wasted. <clears throat> what do you think of being introduced to the crowd walk? What? So like, it's a gay burger, or is it? I just don't really believe in the homosexual lifestyle. I think it's cool. I think it's a cool idea. I think it's great. Finally, yeah, it's about time. Do gay people even eat fast food? Really? Where's the proud whopper? You want to try the proud whopper? Would you like the proud whopper? Huh? Do you want to go with me or without me? Because we can go both ways. Are they different? And what is it? I don't know. Say it. 
it's the same burger. <laughs> Um, and also, um, so one of the one of the things I really like to um, pull out from this is the idea of um, Burger King as like the saviour, right? Uh, we are Burger King. Uh, we really care about gay liberation. But to contextualise this, this um, proud whopper was only um, happening for one day uh, during San Francisco Pride at that one Burger King, uh, which is in the middle of the Pride Parade, right? Um, so that's all that happened, but we get this whole ad from it to make it look like Burger King's really like into the gays. Um, and so this is kind of the thing that we generally see around um, at corporations talking about gay liberation, stuff like this, um, you know. And then also it was just like one piece of paper wrapped around the burger. So it's like, you know, this moment of seeing like uh, gay liberation wrapped around the burger is just like, whew, how did we get here? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, so, and then the idea of um, we're all the same inside, right? We're all the same inside, that's what homonormativity is telling us. We're just like straight people. And I'm kind of like, no, I don't want to be just like straight people. I want to change what that norm is. But gay liberation has taken this up. We are all the same inside. We're just like you. And then corporations have picked up this language, right? That's what neoliberalism does. It subsumes activist language back into itself and then sells it back to us and, and for a profit. That's what's happening here with most gay products. I love my two mummies. You know, bring out the kids to end it on. Um, she's got a little rainbow there in her love heart. Um, so again, we're seeing this idea of the family, right? We look how acceptable we are. We're really loving and caring. We're really good, right? In this ad, you're not seeing any bears giving blowjobs in the back rooms of a club called Babylon. This is all about making us look acceptable and cleaning us up, making sure that we are okay for straight audiences. The other thing um, that I often go on a rant about in terms of all of these campaignings, and particularly around gay marriage, is that we never see any queer sex at all, right? We've all of a sudden become completely desexualized. Sometimes we might see us maybe like giving a hug or like a kiss on the cheek, and that's about it. But here, nothing. There's, not, there's no sex, right? There's none at all. And this is also like if you've been to a pride parade, that's not really what's happening. Yeah. No matter how, how much they try to sanitize us. Particularly in San Francisco. I mean, I've been to that Pride Parade and I've got to tell you, well, actually, not the, not the Sunday Parade, that was quite sanitised, but the Dyke Parade and the Trans Parade is nothing like this. Okay. What else have we got? Oh, I think this means we all have the same rights. Again, see this language of, we all have the same rights. We're just like straight people. And pull out the kid to say that, of course, as well. Um, so, um, oh yeah, this one, this is... Her crying, I mean, a bird has never made me cry before. This is just how empowered we are from Burger King. You know, I'm just feeling so proud standing up here right now to see my this pride flag wrapped around. Oh, I can have a tear. Um, and the idea of, as well, small steps, right? The woman says, I know it's just a small step, but it's part of, like, a longer process. And that small step is from corporations. Actually, no, of course, all of us as activists in the room know that the small steps are actually Sylvia Rivera throwing that brick. 
It's actually the organising that we did around the AIDS crisis, right? There's so many small steps and it's not Burger King. Burger King's, King's coming on the end to try and take our money. And also, let's think about the fact that it's called Burger King, right? And here we have, this is like, so this is how it ends, right? So if you notice throughout the ad, they don't, um, in the advertising for it, this is all you get, right? So there's no mention here of Burger King. Because I don't, I don't actually want to put their name on it in case, because they still want bigots money as well, you know. So they've got to kind of straddle this line. So here we have the pride flag in a crown. Hello, monarchy. What is like? I can't even articulate my rage at this image. But that's this is all that it ends on, right? And so we don't see the Burger King. So you have to be in the know. So Burger King's also playing on the way in which, um, in gay liberation, we have ways that we communicate with each other because of um, fear of persecution. So for queers, we have a certain language and a certain way that, um, that is our type of communication. And here, Burger King's playing on that. It's going, oh, if you're in the know, then you know, right? Similarly, throughout the ad, um, the workers never seem to know what the proud walker is. Multiple times they say, oh, is it any different? And they're like, I don't know, right? But the queer people, we're in the know. So they're playing on this way in which we ourselves have created a language. And then they're trying to sell it again back to us. Um, Oh yeah, here's some other ones. Um, that's the Oreo, um, the Lemonade, and the Absolute Vodka. I just put like a pride flag on it. Oh, oh I skipped ahead there. Um, yeah, and at the um, recent um, Melbourne Mardi Gras, uh, like kind of similar to a Mardi Gras, um, they also even just had companies didn't even, even use the pride flag, and they just had like, marched in it in their uniforms without even pretending, like without even put slapping a flag on there. But one of the things I, I pulled out most is the person who says, I think the meat tastes sweeter, right? So I think we can read a lot into this. The idea of queers being, um, needing to be, by sweetness we think of innocence, right? So queers have consistently been painted as childish. We haven't actually made the step into good heterosexuality. We're back here. We don't have children. We're oversexed. We're all these things, right? Um, so then, of course, not true. I mean, some of us are over sex. That's true. That's a good thing. But not. we can also have children. But that's the idea in the past, right? That we're sweet and we're innocent. So this person's like, I think the meat tastes sweeter. This way in order to ingest queerness to make it acceptable. And one of those ways is this idea of sweetness. Um, and also it comes from the idea of um, like uh, uh, desire in, within capitalism, right? This desire that we need sweetness. For us in the West, we eat so, we, we're always having this idea of like sugar, right? Sugar is really a big part of our diet and something that we desire um, <coughs> for, in order to gain pleasure. And this pleasure then is coming from the dead animal. Um, so I see this as kind of idea that um, pleasure is to eat animals um, and that, that are sweet, that need to be made palatable. And this um, pleasure is inherently linked with the concept of queer sex as non procreative and therefore solely for pleasure. Um, and the link between meat and sex is solidified in this advertisement um, in the idea of um, meat's my preference, yeah? I want to eat the dick. It's really what he's joking there in case you missed that. Um, so we can therefore begin, I'm, I'm trying to work through this idea of um, maybe seeing queers as meat um, and I'm in, in the idea of, as well with Brian Kenny, um, eat the meat. Uh, this is kind of going to be one part of my thesis. Um, okay, so... I've lost my point and I'm just going to blame the jet lag, even though I've been here for like a week, so it's not really fair. Um, <clears throat> so, I think I've already said that. Uh, I was going to, how much time do I have? Almost five minutes. Oh no, okay. I was going to talk about the abject, but let's not go there. Um, okay. <laughs> so, this is just the one example I have, but I've got others, don't you worry. This isn't just the one off thing. So, I'm kind of getting to this idea around <laughs> Now queers are using animals to gain normativity. This is what I'm starting to see. Um, in the we've it, we're also seeing a huge amount of like um, queers using uh, uh, whiteness to obtain normativity um, and uh, able body, etc. Um, and this happens a lot with different movements where, um, in order to try to uh, join a. a